I want to talk to you tonight about the most, well, I'll say the single greatest event in human history. And uh, that's a bit of foreshadowing, but given what weekend it is, um, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, and before we dive into that, man, I just want to say um, that little prayer time that, that we've started doing here, we've had people healed, literally healed, uh, during that prayer time over the last few weeks. Uh, last week, we had someone watching online that was healed through uh, one of the words given, and she was so uh, overcome that she drove here to get more prayer in person, and then we prayed over her husband who experienced a healing, and, uh, and they're, healed to, they're here tonight. So yeah, it's awesome. Um, so we want to keep making prayer more and more and more a priority. And, uh, and that's a prayer time where we want to use spiritual gifts and uh, like uh, words of knowledge, prophetic words, speaking in tongues uh, if the Lord leads. And uh, these are gifts that he's given his church to use to bless one another uh, and to encourage one another in the faith. And, uh, and, and it really creates faith in you. Uh, when, when the Lord starts speaking to some of our prayer team about people who are here, um, that's the Lord singling you out, saying, I want to do something in your life tonight. Um, and that's why we want to pray over you. And so if, if any of those applied to you, maybe you d didn't want to stand up, uh, our prayer team will be available at the end of the service tonight, okay? So we want to we pray over you. So I want to talk to you about the single greatest event in the history of the world. And therefore, I want to talk to you what, about what I think is the greatest question uh, we could ever ask Life is full of questions. Our hearts are full of questions. Uh, we've been asking questions as a human race uh, since the dawn of time, right? Questions like, how did we get here? Questions like, what is the meaning of life? If you believe in God, questions like, why is there so much pain, suffering, and evil in the world? Especially if you believe in a, in a God like we do, who we say is all good, all the time, amen? Amen. But he's also all-powerful. Um, and so if God's all-powerful and all-good, then, then how could he allow such pain, suffering, and evil? These are the questions uh, that tend to captivate our hearts when we start thinking deeply about our existence. And I would suggest tonight, based on what we're going to talk about, that there is another question that actually rises above all of those questions. I think it is the most important question you could ever ask yourself and you could ever get answered for yourself. It's a question that defines all the others. And the question that I think is the, what I would call trillion dollar question in life is did Jesus Christ rise from the dead? And the reason I think that's the greatest question you could ever ask is because if he rose from the dead, then he is who he said he is. Everything in the Bible is true. And all of those other questions that I just mentioned get answered. Because scripture does not skirt around the toughest questions that we ask in life. It addresses them head on. And so the question is, did Jesus rise from the dead? That is the greatest question you could, you could ever get answered for yourself. And I think the Apostle Paul would agree with me uh, because he makes some pretty extreme statements about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so I want to look at 1 Corinthians 15 tonight. If you want to follow in scripture, if you have a Bible with you or a digital Bible, if not, it'll be on the screen. I want to look at this and I want to talk to you about the significance of the resurrection. The significance of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15. He says, now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and, everybody say and, and. that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, it's another Language, another translation for Peter, and to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, 
That's the brother of Jesus, James. Then to all the apostles. Apparently there were other apostles. That's interesting. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Let's jump down to verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? Verse 13, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And listen to this extreme statement. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Jump down to verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. His conclusion, verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Can I get an amen? The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Man, Paul makes some pretty extreme statements here. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, my preaching is useless. Your faith is futile. We're all still in our sins. And if you die in Christ, you're lost. It doesn't even matter. Why would he say that? He says, if, if we're telling you Jesus rose from the dead and he walks through this list of all these guys who were, he's like, I saw it. Some of y'all keep saying there's no resurrection. Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. I saw him with my eyes. This is bothering Paul. This is like, it's getting personal for him, right? Why do you keep saying that? See, they had a problem in their day and age that is the main problem of most people in how they view Jesus in our day and age. Turns out it's not a modern problem. It's an ancient problem. There was a lot of people in their day and age, even in this church in Corinth, uh, that believed that Jesus, everybody knew Jesus was who he was. He was famous in their day and age. The whole known world in that area had heard of Jesus. Uh, by this time, the teaching had reached Rome, had reached Asia, had reached the whole, uh, around the Mediterranean Sea, that whole entire area down to Egypt, um, probably down to Africa even because of Philip evangelizing to uh, the Ethiopian eunuch and all of that. And so uh, the gospel has read, everybody's heard of Jesus and there was, a, there was a lot of people who were like, well, we heard of Jesus. We heard what he taught, that whole golden rule thing. No more eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But like, love your neighbor as yourself. We like that. He's got some good moral teaching. And so we think Jesus' teaching will help us in our lives, in this life. But we don't really believe there's an afterlife. We don't really believe there's a heaven and a, and a hell. There's no resurrection from the dead. And, you know, his followers are a little overzealous. He didn't really rise from the dead. But he was a great teacher. He's like a Plato or an Aristotle. And he, he was wise. And so we want to follow the teachings of Jesus. We want to love each other. But, man, there's no such thing as eternity. There's no such thing as eternal judgment. But we like Jesus. And so we're going to believe in him and in the things that he taught. And Paul's like, if that's why you're believing in Jesus, you're to be most pitied among all men. Because wake up call for you. If you're going to follow Jesus, life, the true Jesus and what he taught, life's going to be more difficult at some point. You're going to get persecuted for your faith. You're going to have to join in the sufferings of Christ. And so if, you're, if, if you believe in Jesus just for this life, Paul's saying, that's sad. There's a reason we believe in Jesus, and it goes far beyond this life. And he's pointing that out. You know, in our day and age, uh, no serious historian or scholar will, will debate whether or not Jesus really lived and, and really existed. No, no scholar will debate that he was born uh, in Bethlehem. No, and, and I'm talking religious or secular scholar. It's well documented, not just in scripture, but in uh, first century historians that were not Christians, such as Tacitus, the Roman historian in the first century, Josephus, the Jewish historian in the first century, talked about the life and the teaching and the death of Jesus Christ. And so no serious historian or scholar in our day and age, no person who knows their history, even if they're an atheist, we all know that Jesus really lived. He was born in Bethlehem. He traveled throughout Israel. He taught in Jerusalem. He, he taught the things the Bible says he teaches. And, and nobody will debate that he died on a cross under Pontius Pilate from the political pressure of the Jewish leaders. That is, that is well-documented historical fact. And so what Paul is saying here is, 
You can believe Jesus was born in Bethlehem and celebrate it every Christmas. You can believe in the things he taught, these good moral teachings. That's great. You can even believe he died on a cross. But if that's where your belief stops, then none of it even matters. It's all in vain. I could say it this way. Even atheists believe in the crucifixion. Paul says there's something so important, so significant about the resurrection that it validates everything that Jesus taught. See, you can believe in the life teaching and death of Jesus and actually devalue the, what he accomplished on the cross. You can devalue his divinity, even believing those facts about his life. But to believe the resurrection is to believe that he is God and it validates what the scriptures say he was doing on the cross. It validates what Jesus said he was doing on the cross. And so I wanna spend the rest of our time talking about three reasons why the resurrection is so significant. And I, wanna, I want you to pay attention and stick with me because we're gonna walk through some stuff. And if you pay attention, if you sit up in your seat, if you listen, even if this is your first time in church, by the time we're done tonight, you, you will be able to understand what Christians believe. It'll be up to you to decide whether you wanna believe it too or not, but you're gonna, under, you're gonna get it. It's gonna be black and white for you tonight. So number one, the first reason that the resurrection is so significant the resurrection reveals our need as people, as the human race. Why does the resurrection reveal that? Well, Jesus wasn't awakened, right? He was resurrected. What was he resurrected from? Sleep? A bad career? No, death. Jesus said he was God in the flesh. The father says, I send my son to you to give his life to die. If God would come to this earth, why would he have to die? That reveals our need, which takes us all the way back to Genesis 1. And while we're at it, let's talk about a few of those questions that I mentioned. How'd we get here? Scripture says God created us. God made us. God put us here, right? So why do we die? How many of you would say that's the human race's greatest need, overcoming this whole death thing. Yeah? Sin and death. We'll put them together. There. There we go. All right. We're in church. <laughs> it's a big deal. Why do we die? God created us. Did God create us to die? No, that was not his first intention. Genesis 1 says that he created us in his image. And we were created to just live forever and be in union with God. That's the reason we were made. Scripture says that God is love. So love is the highest ethic in the universe. We were created in his image, Genesis 1, 27, 28. And so we were created in the image of love. To love and be loved is the meaning of life. To love and be loved by God. To love and be loved by other people. So we were created in the image of love to be able to love, not just to receive it. A prerequisite of being able to love is total and complete free will because a gift that's demanded is no gift at all. Love that is demanded, that is forced, it's not love. It's an obligation. It's a debt. It's a payment. You have to. So God created us in his image just so he could love us and so we could have the capacity as free beings like him to love like he loves. So we have total and complete free will, which means there has to be a choice. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, until they ate of that tree, they only knew good. They knew God and they knew his goodness. And the temptation from an enemy was a suggestion that God is not good. He's holding out on you and you can actually eat that. And, and actually, if you do, you'll be like God. You can be like, God already made us to be like him. Why? Is that the temptation? No, you can be like God without God. See, some people are like, it was a piece of fruit. What's the big deal? It was not just a piece of fruit. It was a choice that was a choice 
outside of who God is. And this is what you have to understand about who God is. He's not just a personal being like you and me, although he is. He's also the eternal, immutable source and definition of love, goodness, God is light, in him is no darkness at all, and life. He's the definition of those things, and he's the source of those things. So to choose anything outside of God is to choose other than love, which is to choose selfishness, which eventually will cause you to harm yourself or other people. That's why scripture says the law and prophets is summed up in this, love others as yourself and love God, because love does no harm to its neighbor. What is the law for? It's for sinful people who aren't being selflessly loving to keep us from harming one another. And so that's why God gave it. But his original intention was that we would be loving. So to choose outside of God is to choose against love, which is to choose selfishness, which will cause you to harm yourself or other people at some point. To choose outside of God is to choose other than goodness, which is to choose evil. To choose outside of God is to choose outside of life, which is to choose death. You see, you can cut a branch off of a tree and it may have some green leaves on it. It may have some fruit on it. And those leaves might stay green for a little while. And that fruit might stay edible for a while. But eventually those leaves are going to wither. And that fruit is going to rot. And you could say it was dead from the day you cut it off. And so though our hearts keep beating, we were dead in our sins and transgressions the moment we chose something outside of God. Our first parents did it. And scripture says every single one of us has done it since the day we were born. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one righteous, not even one. We all have the same condition. We're cut off from God because of our own choice. We have a sinful nature inherited from our first parents, and then we all make decisions, choices that agree with that nature rather than agreeing with God. So that's why we die God said, if you choose other than me, you will die. That is what will happen. I don't think it's so much God punishing them as it is him going, you will be cut off from life. And that's what happens when you do that. So we die because we sin. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And so the resurrection, the fact that Jesus would have to do something for us to be resurrected means he would have to die. And the reason he died is because we die. It reveals our need. It's so significant. Point number two, second reason the resurrection is so significant is the resurrection reveals God's solution to meet our need. I was going to have like seven or 10 points in my sermon about why the resurrection is so great. I realize we'd be here for a long time. So um, the resurrection reveals God's solution to our need. And along with that solution, it reveals God's heart, his love, his will for us. Why did Jesus have to die? Why did he have to die? Because we owed a sin debt to God. Now, that's religious language, so if you're new to God in church, you might be like, okay, I don't get it. Let me make it really plain for you. If you sin against American law, so if you sped on the way here because you were running late, (laughs) if you got caught, right, you have broken the law, you now have to pay a fine, pay a speeding ticket. So if you break the law, you have to pay. Why is that? Now, if if it's a speeding ticket, you have to pay some money. You, You might have to go to a court and sit in front of a judge and and then pay, but you have to pay. If it's a more serious crime, stealing or murder, you're gonna have to pay with your life. You're gonna have to go to jail. If it's bad enough in our country, in some places still, you may literally have to pay with your life. You have to pay if you break a law. Why is that? It's called justice. Justice is an extension of love. It's it's a form of God's discipline. God disciplines those he loves. What is justice discipline? It's twofold. Why do we have to do it? Why do we have to pay? The pay is it costs you. So now, how many of you have sped before? You have to pay, and then afterwards you go, okay, I'm going to slow it down. Why? Because it cost me something. Nobody got hurt yet. 
But now it's costing me because of the justice discipline. So it costs me something. So it's dis meant to discipline your heart. The cost, the discipline is meant to discipline your heart. And secondly, it's to make restitution. You know, there's more accidents because people speed. Or maybe you, maybe you uh, harm someone and you have to pay to make it right for them. Maybe you wreck and you harm their property. You have to pay. It costs you. That's meant to, to train your heart. But now you need to make restitution. You need to make it right. That's just American legal system. When God created a country, by the way, I find it fascinating. God created a country in the Old Testament. We have a case study. How would God set up a country? He, he did it. It's in the Old Testament. It's very fascinating. He set up a, a system of courts and judges and lawyers. The judges and lawyers were also called priests. They were pastors, teachers of God's word. Shepherds is what I mean by pastor. It's a Latin word that means shepherd, pastor. They were also teachers of the law. They were also judges. When, there, when someone broke the law in ancient Israel, they would take the case to the priest. They would investigate. They're, they would act as lawyers and they would act as judges until the case was finished. Okay? So God set up a system. If you sin in their culture, you had to pay with what? A, a sheep or a goat. And you had to take it to the temple. When we read scripture, we think of this so spiritual and so religious. And we're like, why did, why did God... That's like taking your payment to the court to pay for what you did wrong. And so they would take this sheep or goat. It's going to cost you. That's meant to discipline your heart so you don't do it again. <laughs> you were going to eat that sheep. Now you just lost money. You lost food off your table. But it's not arbitrary. They would burn the sheep or goat, part of it, but then the priest would eat part of it. And so... In our day and age, if you get a speeding ticket, you have to pay it. It costs you, right? You have to pay. But then do they just burn the money? I'm like, no, it's just about you paying. No, they use it. The police department uses that, right? It's twofold. There's a practical application. And so God, listen, this is God's grace in the Old Testament. If you sin against me, you're going to have to pay. How is that grace? Because God wants your conscience clean so you can be reunited with him. So you don't, oh, I messed up, and now I'm going to live in shame and be the black sheep of the family and never go to church, synagogue again, never, never be in fellowship with God again. No, God's like, I don't want that. If you mess up, here's a way you can pay to get back right with me. And Scripture says in Hebrews 10, those sacrifices made year after year with, with animals could never fully cleanse the consciences of the worshipers. Because that Old Testament setup, it was just a shadow of the reality that Jesus would fulfill for us. Revelation 3 says, Jesus is the Lamb of God slain before the creation of the world. Now let's pause right here and talk about one of those other questions real, real quick, if you got time. Why is he the lamb slain before the creation of the world? That means before the creation of the world, God who exists outside of time and space was, was imagining creating us and he saw that we would mess up, that there would need to be provision, which also means he saw that there would be sin, suffering, evil, sickness, death, pain, trauma, abuse, war. He saw all that. How could an all-powerful, all-good God who foresaw all of that, still create us and then allow it. Many great theologians have said, and many great philosophers have said, only if that all-powerful, all-good being could see that a greater good would result, not even in, in spite of the pain, suffering, and evil, but even because of it. Think about it this way. If I had a knife and I walked up to you and I cut you open from here to here, is that bad or good? Just in and of itself. That's bad. You could call that an evil act. It's a bad thing. It's an evil thing. But if you call that knife a scalpel, and if you call me a surgeon, and I cut you open here to here, because there's a redemptive process I'm going to take you through called surgery, for a short-term evil, I can reach into you and get something in you that you didn't even know was there called cancer, which is killing you, and take it out, and then sew you up, and you will be better off not even in spite of me cutting you, but even because of it. Scripture says we will judge angels. 
So he made us a little lower than the angels, but somehow in eternity, we're going to be, it's going to flip-flop. We're going to judge angels. How's that? I think that's prophesying to what God knew all along. That if in the garden when they sin, uh, don't let them eat from that tree of life. Why? Because then you would be in an eternal, unredeemed state. You'd be like the devil and his demons, headed for hell. No chance of redemption. No, 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 don't let them do that. We're going to let them die this natural death thing because I'm going to work a plan of redemption. Redeem means to make up for. Perhaps God is so good even when we sin, when we do bad things, when we commit evil against one another, when we give the enemy, the devil, power and authority in our lives. Perhaps God is so good. There's some way that he can make up for it in such a way that we're better off in the end than we were before it all ever even happened. And so we'll judge angels in eternity. Why is that? I think it has to do with our redemption that it says, then we shall know fully, even as we're fully known. Now we don't know fully. So in eternity, we'll know God as the angels do in his glory. We'll know his goodness. We'll know his holiness, but we'll also know something the angels don't know. His grace, because they never sin. We'll know what it's like to go through suffering. You know, isn't it interesting? Jesus, his, in his glorified body, still had the scars. Jesus suffered to identify with us. We already suffer, but when we're redeemed in heaven, we'll know God's glory, his goodness. We'll also know the depth of his grace, and we'll be able to commune and fellowship with Jesus in a deeper way than even angels. When before it all happened, yeah, God's good and our life's good, but man, what if? That what if question is always back there, isn't it? Then we choose, okay, let's find out. Oh, this is horrific. Now we know what if. Now we get redeemed. Wow, God's so good. He not only loves us when we're being perfect, good little goody two-shoes over here. He loves us even when we're rejecting him. Romans 5, 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Wow, his good goes far beyond what we could have ever known, and we never want to walk away again because we know what happens when we do that. And so maybe there is a greater good in the glory of our redemption. And so Jesus is the lamb slain before the creation of the world. Meaning he and the father co-creating all things with the spirit. And they already knew redemption was going to need to be provided for. And Jesus said, I'll do it. Isaiah 53, it was the Father's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Jesus knew that was his Father's will. But Jesus said, make no mistake, nobody takes my life from me, I lay it down from my own accord. When they came to arrest him, he's like, don't you know that with a word, I can call my Father, he would send 12 legions of angels to help me? When they came to arrest him, they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. And they drew back and fell to the ground under the power of his word. And you think it was the chains that held him in their custody? You think it was the nails that held him on that cross? As they mocked him and said, if you're the son of God, if you're divine, if you're all powerful, come down off that cross and prove it. See, they thought for Jesus to prove he was God, it would be come off the cross and save yourself. But Jesus knew even though God is mighty, God is not might. God is love. And so to prove he was God, he would stay on the cross to save all of us. And so the resurrection testifies to our need, testifies to God's redemptive solution, And my last point here, the resurrection is so, so significant because it testifies. This is the most important point, by the way. Save the best for last. Testifies of God's reality. God's reality. Would you agree, perhaps if you're a skeptic or an atheist here tonight, that if something miraculous were to take place that defies the laws of physics, then perhaps there might be a God. 
because nothing in the natural can cause something supernatural. Something supernatural happens when something outside of the natural intervenes and causes something supernatural to happen. And so the resurrection was not a natural event. I was just thinking about it this week. You know, Jesus raised a few people from the dead. I know stories of believers in our day and age who have prayed over people and brought them back to life. But nobody was in that tomb laying hands on Jesus. He was dead. Dead, dead. Three days dead. Doornail dead. And he rose again. And the Apostle Paul writes this in Romans 1, verse 4. This is the NLT version. Jesus was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Spirit. What's Paul saying here? Here's why the resurrection is so important. It proves Jesus is God. All authority has been given to him. He overcame sin and death by sin and death, and he proved he overcame it when he rose from death the dead. It's interesting. Most people who are not Christians in our culture say, they would say, well, Jesus was a good moral teacher, but that was it. I like the way C.S. Lewis writes about that. He, He says, Jesus doesn't leave us room to believe that about him, nor did he intend to leave us room to believe that about him. It's called Lewis's trilemma. Because Lewis said, if you judge Jesus based on Jesus's own words, the, th- the claims he made about himself, he was one of three things, a liar, a lunatic, or Lord, who he says he is. Why did Lewis say that? John chapter eight, Jesus is debating with the Pharisees and he claimed to know Abraham. And they go, by the way, Abraham lived 2000 years before Jesus. That's like me saying, oh, I know the apostle Paul. Yeah, we're buds, I know him. And they said, you're not even 50 years old yet, and you know Abraham? And he said, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was, I am. The words I am there, that was intentional on his part. He's referencing the name of Father God, the song we sang. Forever Yahweh, Yahweh, Yehovah. However you pronounce the unpronounceable name, Y-H-W-H in the Hebrew. When, when God told Moses he, his name, he said, I am that I am. Because a name defines something and God can't be defined. So he's like, I just am. <laughs> I am. That's my name. Tell him I am sent you. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And it says they picked up stones to kill him. Because they knew he was claiming to be God in the flesh. Jesus also said, they're going to kill me. And three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. He said it several times. So if he didn't rise from the dead, he's not God. Which means he's either a liar. He didn't rise from the dead and he's not God. Or he's a lunatic. He actually believes he's God. He believed he would rise from the dead and he didn't. Or... He is Lord. He did rise from the dead. Before Abraham was, he was. So if the resurrection validates Jesus, which Paul clearly says that's what it did, then the question of all questions is, did Jesus rise from the dead? Our faith hinges upon its answer, but so does your life and your eternity. And so there's another question we have to ask to be able to answer that question. How can we know if Jesus rose from the dead? How can we know? That's a truth claim. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. To verify any truth claim, you have to use evidence, right? If I said bunnies are really aliens from outer space, Invading earth to eventually take over. That's a truth claim. What's the evidence? I have zero because it's a total fallacy. So you're not going to believe it because there's no evidence, right? Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It's a truth claim. What's the evidence? How can we know? The apostle Paul told us, told the first century people how they could know. That's why he wrote that. And after 
it says, he appeared to Cephas Peter. But not just Peter, not just one person. He then appeared to the 12 apostles. He then appeared to over 500 people at one time. He then appeared to James and the other apostles. He then appeared to me after his ascension even. That's why Paul says, as to one abnormally born. He's like, I'm the weird one. I'm the odd duck out. That was after he ascended to heaven even. What's Paul's point? It's interesting. There's so many witnesses of the resurrection in the New Testament. This is Paul's invitation to people in that day and age. Go to, he says, many of whom are still alive. Go to Jerusalem and start asking around and you're gonna bump into someone who saw Jesus after the Romans crucified him, ran a spear into him, blood and water flowed out, meaning he's all out of blood. He's dead, dead. Ain't no coming back if you're just a man. And there were hundreds of people in Jerusalem who saw him after he raised. And this is Paul's invitation. Go ask them. See if I'm lying. It's interesting that Scripture says, let everything be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's God's invitation. Test my word. Most other major world religions are the result of one person off by themselves in the woods, having what they say is a divine encounter. They write it down. Those revelations become the scriptures. And now you have to believe one person who was by themselves with no other witnesses who say they got things from God. Mohammed, off by himself, revelation, wrote it down, Quran, just got to take my word for it. And by the way, if you don't, I'll kill you. Buddha, off by himself in the woods. Oh, divine encounter, nirvana. Oh, yeah, I wrote some things down. Sutras, oh, scriptures. Yep, just got to take my word for it. But I'm nice and I won't kill you. Christianity is unique. You know, the Bible is not just one book. It's a library of books written over a period of 1,400 years by over 40 different authors across three different continents in three different languages, yet it tells one comprehensive story from beginning to end. God is trying to drill it through humanity's thick skulls. I'm real. This is my word. Jesus is my son. Many witnesses in the New Testament. Many witnesses. Paul says in our day and age, hey, Go to Jerusalem and start asking around. You're going to find them. Now, it's been approximately 1,990 years since Jesus died on the cross, right? 90, 89, something like that. Give or take a year or two. So those guys are all long gone. So, so how can we know? The scriptures. It's been written down. It's been preserved in a historical document, not just one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four complimentary eyewitness accounts. The Apostle Paul, his, that's, that's five, him writing. James, says he appeared to James. James got a book in there. Oh, there's six. You know, oh, wow. This is a, oh, there's a lot of data here. And so, yeah, it really comes down for us in our day. Then the next question is, can we trust the Bible? Are the scriptures reliable as a historical source of information, not, quote unquote, just fairy tales or myths? Well, let's just take a minute and compare just the New Testament scriptures for our purposes tonight, because those are the ones that testify to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And let's compare the New Testament scriptures to other historical documents that Scholars in our day and age, secular scholars, most secular scholars say that these historical documents are, are reliable, they've been verified, and we, we are writing histories for schools and for colleges out of the works of people like Plato, Aristotle, uh, the history of Rufus who chronicled Alexander the Great's life, his biography, Julius Caesar, who wrote Gaelic Wars, Josephus, as I mentioned, Tacitus, all of these guys' writings are considered uh, valid. They're considered um, trustworthy as historical documents. So let's compare those to the New Testament scriptures. 
First of all, some people will say, well, the Bible was written by the people who experienced it, so we can't trust that. Which is silly, because in a court of law, when you have eyewitness testimony, that's what it is. It's from the people who experienced it. Does that make sense? These documents I've just mentioned are all considered reliable and trustworthy. And guess what? All of those but one are the guys who apparently wrote it. So Julius Caesar's works were written by Julius Caesar. And we trust those. So that rules that out, right? So when it comes to historical documents, there's two main tests. These were written a long time ago on things like papyrus and things like that, which over time wear out in scrolls. You're rolling them up, you're unrolling them. They get worn out, the ink fades, right? So they would make copies. We don't have originals of any of these works. We have copies of the originals. And so scholars who study all of this, not just religious, even secular historians who study all of this, there's two main tests. How many copies do you have of the work? Because the more copies you have, you can compare the copies to one another and see if there's differences among them. And if there's differences, especially in the later copies, then you know there's probably been some myth or legend added, those types of things. But also, how long has it been since the person lived that it's about, or supposedly wrote it, to when the copies were made? Of course, the closer it is, the more verifiable, the more it's called, the more it's considered authentic. So let's just compare the ones I mentioned, which, were some of, which are some of the most um, major historical documents in antiquity with the New Testament of the scriptures. So let's go through this rather quickly. Plato, the works of Plato. Plato lived in 400 BC. We have seven copies of his work written. The copies, the earliest copies were written 1,200 years after Plato. Yet this is considered verifiable, authentic. We can trust this was Plato. These are his works. Aristotle, a student of Plato, lived in the 300s BC. We have 49 copies of his work written 1,400 years after the originals. Alexander the Great's biographies written by Rufus um, a few hundred years after he lived, uh, after Alexander lived in, in the 300s. We have two copies of his biographies written 400 years after Alexander the Great lived, which, okay, that's better on the timeline. Julius Caesar, who lived in around 100 BC, apparently wrote Gaelic Wars. We have 12 copies of that work written, uh, the earliest copies, a thousand years after Caesar passed away. Josephus, the Jewish historian, first century Jewish historian, we have two copies of his work written 700 years after he lived. Tacitus, the Roman historian, we have 20 copies of his work written 1,000 years after he lived. So how does just the New Testament manuscripts compare to all of those historical documents? Well, let's just go with the Greek manuscripts alone because it was rapidly translated into many other languages. So we'll just go with the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament of the Bible. There are 5,686 copies of Greek manuscripts. The earliest of these manuscripts were written less than 100 years from the originals. So just comparing apples to apples and being intellectually honest, we can say that the New Testament of the Bible then is the most attested and reliable document in antiquity. And yet for some reason, everybody will accept all those others. Oh, but not, not this. Sir Frederick Kenyon, the former director of the British Museum, said it this way, and also the author of the Paleography of Greek Papyri, in case you're wondering. In no other case is the interval of time between the composition of the book and the date of the earliest manuscripts so short as in that of the New Testament. The last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to us as substantially as they were written has now been removed. There's a book, there's been several books that chronicle all that that I just shared, but there's a book in particular that I've mentioned many times uh, called The Case for Christ that talks about all of this evidence. Lee Strobel uh, was an, an hardened atheist back in the late 70s, early 80s, and his wife became a Christian and started teaching their daughter about the Bible stories, and he got upset because he thought, you're teaching her fairy tales, and he was mad about that. And so he set out to disprove Christianity. He, was, he had a law degree, and he was a, a criminal justice uh, journalist 
for the, an editor for the Chicago Tribune at the time. So he set out to do it in a very, the way he would investigate a criminal case, to investigate Christianity. And his, his intent was to disprove it and then write a book about it, proving that Jesus didn't rise from the dead and none of this is true. And he not only weighed what I just told you, but basically looked at the evidence for Christianity and for Christ, his life, death, and resurrection, the viability of the scriptures, all of it, from every angle. And the conclusion he came to was that the evidence, just the, the evidence, he basically said this, and I'm paraphrasing, if, if I were to weigh the evidence as you would in a court of law, in many court cases where you don't know for sure, you have to weigh all this evidence, right? The evidence overwhelmingly favors the fact that the scriptures are true. So if they're true, then we have a decision to make, don't we? And that's how he closes that whole entire book. And I want to read you uh, his quote. He says, after, at the end of this two-year journey, he says, I'll admit it. I was ambushed by the amount and quality of evidence that Jesus is the unique son of God. As I sat at my desk that Sunday afternoon, I shook my head in amazement. I had seen defendants carted off to the death chamber on much less convincing proof. After a personal investigation that spanned more than 600 days and countless hours, my own verdict in the case for Christ was clear. As someone educated in journalism and law, I was trained to respond to the facts wherever they lead. For me, the data demonstrated convincingly that Jesus is the Son of God who died as my substitute to pay the penalty I deserved for the wrongdoing I had committed. So on November 8, 1981, I talked with God in a heartfelt and unedited prayer, admitting and turning from my wrongdoing and receiving the gift of forgiveness and eternal life through Jesus. I told him that with his help, I wanted to follow him in his ways from here on out. He, he wanted to disprove Christianity and the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. He ended up being convinced that it's actually true. And so he became a Christian. He's a pastor now to this day. And this is how he closes his book. He says, I do feel a strong obligation to urge you to make this a front burner issue in your life. Don't approach it casually or flippantly because there's a lot riding on your conclusion. As Michael Murphy aptly put it, we ourselves and not merely the truth claims are at stake in the investigation. In other words, if my conclusion in the case for Christ is correct, your future and eternity hinge on how you respond to Christ. As Jesus declared in John 8, 24, if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. If you don't believe Jesus is the one he claims to be. If you go by what he claimed to be, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he is Lord. And the one in in history that gives us the answer is the resurrection. So did Jesus rise from the dead? Well, if not, my preaching is useless. So is your faith. We're all still in our sins. (laughs) But if he has been raised, then it's all true. He is Lord. And by the way, all of our other questions get answered. Where did we come from? God made us. What's the meaning of life? To love and be loved. Why is there sin, suffering, pain, and evil in the world? Because we sinned and fell short of the glory of God. Well, how could a good and loving, all-powerful God allow that? Because he saw the glory of his redemption by sending his son to die for us on a cross, to pay for the death we deserved, to buy us back from sin and death, so that in eternity we could know not only the fullness of his glory and his goodness, but also the depth of his grace. Wow. So Paul's conclusion, 1 Corinthians 15, 19, and 20. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. You know, if I live for Jesus and it's not true, then you could say I'm most to be most pitied among all men. But if you live for the world and it is true, then you're to be most pitied among all men. Because what good is it if you gain the whole world but forfeit your soul? And so I want to close with one more question. It's from Jesus in John 11, 25 and 26. 
Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Let's pray. God, I just pray for every person listening who's been on the fence, who's been living life, investigating you, checking into you, reading a little Bible here, going to church here and there, reading a book here or there, watching a clip or two on YouTube here or there, trying to get their questions answered. God, I pray for those wrestling with faith tonight, and I pray that you would meet them in this place. I want to lead a, a little prayer time here for just a couple minutes. And if you're here tonight, and man, you still got questions, and you're not quite ready to say, I want to be a Christian, I want to invite you to say this prayer. Jesus, if you are real, would you please reveal yourself to me? Because if you're real, I want to believe in you. If that's you here tonight, just say that prayer right now out loud. You could say it under your breath. You could whisper it. You could say it in your heart. But just take a minute, if that's you, and say, man, I'm just still not sure. Just say that prayer. Jesus, if you're real, if you really rose from the dead, if you're really alive, if you can really hear me, would you please reveal yourself to me? That's a good prayer for those who are questioning. But there might be a few others of you here tonight who you know the truth. Maybe you've heard it before. Maybe you were raised in church. Maybe you're first here tonight, but you're like, oh my goodness, this is true. This is real. I want to believe. I want to I wanna become a Christian. And if that's you here tonight, the Apostle Paul said this in Romans 10, verse 9. He said, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We're saved when we believe Jesus is who he said he is, that he's Lord, that he loves us so much, he died for us on the cross to pay for the sin and death, the death that we deserve, to trade places with us. It's like we all have a sin debt. There's a warrant out for our arrest. And if another person who has a warrant out for their arrest tries to pay your debt, they'll just arrest them too. We've all been arrested by sin and death, except Jesus. Because he was God in the flesh, he's the only person in history who never sinned. And so he didn't have a warrant out. And he came to your defense. It's like he was your defense lawyer. And he said to the judge, hey, listen, I want to pay this person's debt. You take me and, and you let them go free. And the judge actually agreed to it because here's the mystery. The judge is your father and Jesus is your brother and they both love you. So they were willing to do that for you. And so now all you have to do is agree to it and say, okay, I'm going to take what Jesus did for me on the cross to pay for my sins. I'm going to receive it. Scripture says to all who received him, he gives the right to become children of God. And so if that's you here tonight, I'm going to lead you in a very short, simple prayer where you just ask Jesus to forgive your sin and you're becoming a Christian, you're repenting, you're saying, I don't want to live for myself and my sin anymore. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to become a Christian. I'm going to do my best to try to follow what God has for me in life. And that's all it is. And uh, if you say this prayer sincerely, Jesus will save you. You will be saved. Uh, he'll give you the gift of his Holy Spirit and you'll have the hope of heaven the rest of your life here on this earth. And so if that's you here tonight and you want to say this prayer with me, would you just lift up your hand and just say, that's me, I want to pray. I see a little hand back there. Anybody else want to pray with us tonight? All right. Well, church, let's pray out loud together. Say, dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Make me brand new. Help me live for you all the days of my life. And give me the gift of your Holy Spirit. In your name, Jesus, I pray. 
Amen.